Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we will be exploring consciousness and reality. With me is Professor Tom Lombardo. He is the author of Future Consciousness, A Path to, to Purposeful Evolution. He is also the author of The Evolution of Future Consciousness and Contemporary Futurist Studies and Mind Flight, A Journey into the Future. He is the director of the Center for Future Consciousness in Tempe, Arizona. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure when to be with you. When we talk about consciousness and reality, we're looking at probably the most elusive problem in all of philosophy. It's definitely one of the oldest problems in modern philosophy, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to uh, Rene Descartes, for sure, and his uh, dualistic philosophy mm -hmm. of separating mind from uh, physical matter mm -hmm. and separating them in a way that created what came to be referred to as <clears throat> the hard problem, mm -hmm. which is how consciousness, which seems to have one set of properties, is connected with physical matter in the physical body, which has a different set of properties. Right, right. And um, I've done quite a few interviews on this topic, and mm -hmm. one of the points that comes uh, across is that the average person, not a philosopher, but is sort of instinctively a dualist. Uh, yes, I would imagine that that's true. Mm -hmm. They're instinctively a dualist until they start thinking about what the implications of that are. Yeah. For example, how does a thought get my physical muscles to move mm -hmm. and my body to move? Yeah. Or how does an electrochemical activity in the brain produce a uh, experience of the smell of a rose? Mm -hmm. Uh, then it becomes a challenge to try to make that ontological jump in either direction mm -hmm. from mind to matter or matter to mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I know uh, Max Planck, the uh, founder of quantum theory, or one of the one of the founders, mm -hmm. one of the important founders of mm -hmm. quantum theory, puzzled over this because of the observer problem in quantum mechanics, and he he concluded you just can't get underneath consciousness. Yes, it is a difficult thing to get underneath. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, a good uh, quick story yeah. to bring this point home mm -hmm. is uh, when I was in college, I remember first reading Bishop Barclay oh, yes. and Bishop Barclay's uh, theory of uh, perception. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bishop Barclay presented to me what seemed to be a very convincing argument, which is that whatever I refer to as something meaningful, something I can know, always seems to be an experience. Mm -hmm. Even things like the experience of seeing the color red, mm -hmm. or feeling the solidity of an object, mm -hmm. or of smelling some delicious food, for example, in that I can never say anything that's meaningful beyond my conscious experiences. So to assume that there is something beyond my conscious experiences is a leap of faith. Yeah. And so the notion of physical matter doesn't seem to make any sense. Mm -hmm. What makes sense is that the totality of my existence, everything I am, reduces down to conscious experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, and whether I'm doing quantum physics or whether I'm doing biology or whether I'm talking to you right now, it all is a complex array of conscious experiences with various perceptual emotional qualities to them. I've often thought of Bishop Barclay, for whom the city of Berkeley, California, yes. was was named, was a very logical thinker. His his argument seems, on the one hand, very unsettling, and on the other hand, irrefutable. Yes, it does seem irrefutable, except my intuition was that he was the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how can one come up with a convincing alternative yeah. to Barclay's idealism, which is everything that exists is consciousness and right. ideas in mm -hmm. consciousness. And ultimately the mind of God. And ultimately the mind of God. Yeah. And he had a slip in the mind of God because uh, when um, I'm not looking at or experiencing the red rose, which uh -huh. is an idea, according yeah. to him, uh -huh. where is that idea of a red rose while no one is looking at it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's in the mind of God. Yeah. That was his jump. Mm -hmm. uh, well, anyway, I saw Bishop Barclay as a uh, epistemological and an ontological challenge uh, because he was so convincing. Mm -hmm. How does one uh, do? How does one yeah. come up with an alternative? <clears throat> because intuitively, it did not make sense to mm -hmm. me to think that uh, uh, that that physical matter, in some sense whatsoever, is nothing but a camera, an illusion, mm -hmm. and it's just all mind. Now, I'm, undoubtedly you're aware of the famous conversation between Boswell and Johnson about Bishop Oh, Barclay. yes, of course. Yes, uh -huh. right. And Boswell, of course, um, uh, and Johnson, actually, Johnson's reputation, which was to kick the rock, yeah. was a misconception. It, it was a refutation that in no sense whatsoever refuted Barclay, mm -hmm. because Barclay would have simply said that the uh, uh, the kicking of the rock was a combination of a visual perception and a tactual and a haptic perception, mm -hmm. and so the totality of the experience of kicking the rock was all in your mind. That mm -hmm. was it. Yeah. So uh, uh, he was never able to get to the rock, so to speak. Right. Yes. I mean, and, but Johnson un undoubtedly felt, you know, the common sense trumps uh, logic. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. He. I guess he could think that, and in fact. Uh, what, 200 years later, uh, the uh, uh, Cambridge philosopher G. E. Moore attempted to prove the existence of the external world using his hands. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like a similar kind of argument. Yeah. Like, here is my hand. My hand is a physical object. I can see it. Therefore, the external physical world exists. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I'm oversimplifying G. E. Moore, yeah. but in fact, it came down to a similar kind mm -hmm. of argument. Well, I, I gather that the the real refutation of uh, Bishop Barclay comes from taking his argument to its logical conclusion, which is solipsism. You could take it to that conclusion. You could take it to the conclusion that each of us individually exists in our own bubble of consciousness. Mm -hmm. We can never go beyond that yeah. sphere or bubble of consciousness. Yeah. And therefore, right now, I'm simply talking to this image in my bubble of consciousness, which I refer to as Jeff. Yeah. And in your bubble of consciousness, you're talking to this image that you refer to as Tom. But Tom and Jeff never really make contact with each other. We're each in our own little spheres. And that in particular concerned me because, and although this may be not an exactly a logical argument, it means that you can never have intimacy and resonance and love with another distinctive human being mm -hmm. because each of us is trapped in our own little solipsistic existence. Uh, and um, um, solipsism um, uh, could lead to the conclusion, which is rather grandiose and paranoid, that perhaps the only thing that really exists is my own consciousness, and to infer there's anything else mm -hmm. is a jump, is another leap of yep. faith. Yep. Uh, so I'm the totality of existence? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, which is what mystics say. Yes. Uh -huh. Ultimately, and I don't think they mean it in a solipsistic way. They, they're referring to the interconnectedness of everything. Well, that's a totally different kind of thing. Yeah. Then the interconnectedness of everything must mean that there are things that are interconnected. When if one starts from idealism, all I know is what I experience, mm -hmm. to I'm trapped in my consciousness, then there are not these other things that I can legitimately mm -hmm. talk about. Yeah. If I include the interconnectedness of other things, then I'm assuming that there is a reality beyond this thing here mm -hmm. and that somehow we're connected together. And I think that, in fact, we are connected together and I think, in fact, uh, that 
we actually do resonate, interface with each other, and we interface with each other in a conscious, intimate way. More so, the better we get to know each other. Yeah. But I don't think we are trapped. But uh, the but Barclay and Descartes early on mm -hmm. led to this possibility that all we could know would be our conscious experiences and that the physical world is nothing but an inference. Uh, and that creates a puzzle. You yeah. describe a, a time in your life when trying to think through this puzzle made you dizzy. Yes. In fact, it's made me dizzy on several occasions. And I would use Bishop Barclay as an example where I did get dizzy. Because if you grow up and you assume that there is this physical world that you see around you, mm -hmm. that you exist within, and it's intuitively perfectly obvious that this exists, and then somebody presents a convincing argument that in fact what you thought all of this was, that doesn't, it doesn't really exist in the way you thought it did, mm -hmm. then it feels like the floor and the ground has literally been pulled out from under your feet mm -hmm. and reality goes into a flip-flop. Yep. You have a gestalt switch. You have a fundamental paradigm shift in consciousness where everything is seen differently mm -hmm. if you buy into Bishop Barclay. And that was only one case where, you know, you can get that kind of experience of uh, dizziness. Um, I know Immanuel Kant had a similar line of thinking. Uh, yeah, Immanuel Kant had a similar line of thinking insofar as he argued, all I can meaningfully talk about are phenomena, and phenomena are um, uh, interpreted in terms of the categories of understanding and the pure intuitions of space and time, but those categories of understanding and intuitions do not necessarily apply to the thing in itself. Mm -hmm. So, But he uh, believed that there was a thing in itself mm -hmm. beyond experience. That but, we could never know. But we could never know, yeah. and I felt like Kant got himself into uh, a meaningless discussion that actually contradicted his principles by even making reference to the notion of the thing in itself, mm -hmm. since according to him, the only thing you can meaningfully talk about were your phenomenal experiences. Yeah. So you can't even say that there is a thing in itself, although mm -hmm. he says he believes there is. He, he, he thinks that there is something out there. Thing in itself is a funny term. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a term that seems like it means something, but when you start to think about it, what is the thing in itself, because that would mean understanding its intrinsic nature independent of any relationships it has with anything else. Right. Does that make any sense? Well, it might make some sense. Yes. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm tossing it out. Yeah, yes. I, well, for example, here's a thing. Yes. Yes, there it is. It exists independent of, of you or me. We That's what we believe yeah. if we don't buy Bishop Barclay. Yeah. Okay, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, and uh, of course, it means something unique to me. It might mean something unique to you. But right. But it's, it's a thing in and of itself. I, you and I might be able to agree to that. Oh, I think we do agree that it's a yeah. thing in and of itself. Yeah. But if we're following his logic, mm -hmm. Barclay's logic, yeah. then each of us is making reference to a distinctive perceptual experience mm -hmm. when we, when we uh, in our field of view, mm -hmm. our finger points to another object, the image of this sculpture, yeah. in our field of view, in our phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. And so when I do this to yeah. point to the thing in itself, I'm actually just experiencing my experience of my finger, my experience of the statue, and you're doing the same thing. And we haven't really got at then this presumed thing in itself, which is where Barclay says it becomes yeah. meaningless then. You, we, both of us think there's something there independent of us experiencing yeah. it. Well, subsequent <laughs> to Barclay and Kant yeah, and yeah. Descartes, we have the uh, development of uh, perceptual psychology. We yes. know how the eye works. We yes. know how the ear works. Yes. And right, we right. have a, a, a much greater understanding of how the human consciousness incorporates sensory information. Good, good. And that's a good lead in to actually adding to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Because 
the study of the brain, the nervous system, sensory stimulation, human psychology indicates that um, the, uh, those systems are selectively sensitive mm -hmm. to only narrow ranges of stimulus energy. Yep. So the totality of reality a lot of it is filtered out. Which, which would be in agreement with Kant's categorical... Yes, right. Uh, a lot of it is filtered out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Number one. Yeah. Okay. And secondly, we also know that the statue from the study of physics and chemistry could be analyzed at multiple levels of analysis yep. from its three-dimensional gestalt shape down to vibratory patterns of electrons. Mm -hmm. Now, we do not see this as vibratory patterns of electrons. We see it as a solid three-dimensional shape, mm -hmm. okay? So we're only tapping into a small selected aspect of reality through our sensory systems. And then, on top of all of that, our sensory systems, our perceptions and sensory experiences are constantly being interpreted and organized and made sense of through our concepts, our memories, our theories of reality. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to our conscious experience of the statue, yep. it has been, uh, it, we have a selective, perspectival, interpreted conscious reality, yes. which is not in any sense whatsoever some absolute, multi-perspective, omnidirectional, intrinsic thing in itself. Could never be. It could never be. Yeah. Yes, it could never be. I mean, yeah. Humans always have a perspective. They always have a perspective. They always are selective. We resonate in with certain things. We don't resonate in with other things. We interpret things different ways. Mm -hmm. Somebody could look at that and see uh, something totally meaningless. Yep. Somebody else will see a work of art. Um, and in fact, another thing that we all do, which is very significant with respect to our interface with reality, is that we are active exploratory beings. We don't sit still when we engage reality. Right. So if I want to get a better apprehension of that object, I begin to do this, mm -hmm. which is to look at it from multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. which enhances my perception of it. And so uh, just sitting there and letting reality, so to speak, hit <laughs> you in the face is not what we do. Mm -hmm. We select, we interpret, we explore, we manipulate, and the more we do that, our perceptions become clearer, but it definitely is not a passive, just let reality hit me in my face experience. Right. Yes. And, uh, and I suppose the, another uh, slant <laughs> on it is in theory, we could build a computer and take every perspective that humans have ever had on everything, mm -hmm. put it all into the mind of the computer, yes. so the computer might be able to begin to approach this idea of all perspectives at once. Yeah, it could approach it, but it'll never realize it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it never realizes it because <clears throat> um, perspective is a dynamic a gestalt. And by that I mean that it's not simply a set of points of observation. Mm -hmm. It's a set of pathways of integrative observation. Mm -hmm. um, we never see anything in a moment. We always see things across time, and we never see things at a hypothetical absolute point. We always see things in some uh, a broader, uh, narrow, uh, but still not pointillistic uh, observation. Mm -hmm. And so I would suggest that there is an infinite number of perspectives that could be taken on the statue. So unless you have a computer that could compute an infinite number of perspectives, mm -hmm. you're never gonna get the totally complete omnidirectional. Yeah. 
And also, for example, we live at a certain level of time mm -hmm. and we could slow the whole thing down. We could speed the whole thing up. And those also are legitimate perspectives, yeah. too, like looking at a flower blossom, speed it up mm -hmm. or looking at an electron move, slowing things down. Uh, all of this part of the perspectives, too. You get you're going to end up with no way possible conceivable to have the absolute total uh, all perspectives pulled together. So what you're suggesting then if, is that reality is virtually infinite because of the various perspectives that are possible but the, the human being is a finite being. Right, yes, right. So we select out from a indeterminately large plentitude mm -hmm. and a plentitude that is in so, I don't want to say infinite yeah. but is indeterminately deep in richness yeah. and we can penetrate into it in multiple ways but it may in principle be inexhaustible mm -hmm. yes which raises the question of how, how can we even understand each other if we're all always seeing things differently? Yeah, well, I don't think we all see things all that differently. Uh -huh. I think that there's a lot of variation between us, of course, but there's also a lot of invariance or commonality, mm -hmm. too. Like, for example, right now, we both are engaging in what we believe is a meaningful conversation where there is, we believe, some level of mutual understanding going on because we share a common language and we share common concepts. We may have variations in those concepts too, mm -hmm. and we don't get everything that each of us says, but we get quite a good deal. Mm -hmm. And in part, that's due to the fact that we have similar brains, that our minds probably have similar features and properties to them. They were all a product and embedded within a giant ambient earth that was our uh, uh, what mother uh, gestation environment that we emerged out of. And so it makes sense that we would have a good deal of resonance. That's not like to say that we don't have a lot of dissonance and disagreement, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think we do make contact and mutually understand each other to a degree at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. To a degree. To a degree. Yeah. Yes, to a degree. Yes. I think we understand each other. Uh -huh. My sense is we understand yeah. each other to a degree. Of course, people make jokes about the fact, you know, especially uh, husbands and wives and partners who say, you don't understand me at all. I don't, you live in a different universe or mm -hmm. something. Yes. Um, um, I have a friend who is a, um, a, a Buddhist meditator, and he has a totally different theory of reality than myself. Mm -hmm. But we get into these intense arguments, and we can't get into intense arguments unless there's some commonality there that we um, uh, start from. I say to him that we live in the same universe, but we interpret it entirely differently. But if we didn't live in the same universe, we wouldn't even understand what the hell each other was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think there's a lot more that we have in common than we may realize. But of course, there's a lot in which we are different mm -hmm. as well, too. That's why we have conversations. So we learn yeah. from each other. We learn things the other one didn't know. Well, we've yeah. raised uh, a lot of interesting issues. And I know there's more to say. We're, we're going to do a future interview on the reciprocity of mind and... Uh, yes, we are. Mind and reality. Yes, in but, fact, that will be where I will present at least an approximation mm -hmm of a way to understand the relationship between the conscious mind and the physical world after we've introduced the puzzle of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Tom Lombardo, thank yeah. you once again for this yeah. fascinating discussion. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And thank you for being with us. Watch the program listings for future discussions with Professor Tom Lombardo. Thank you.